delighted, absolutely delighted to be talking about this really important topic, preserving innovation incentives, because Europe needs to focus on R&D intense sectors to keep its relatively high paid and skilled workforce in employment. And that's going to be even more important um, to focus on innovation and high value sectors in order to bring Europe out of the uh, current downturn that we're all experiencing. Now, the Juncker Commission, of course, put innovation at the center of its agenda, but didn't have a lot to show for it. But I think there has been a real sea change in Brussels, at least. Von der Leyen's commission has come out saying, we are a geopolitical commission. We want to protect and to project the EU's economic and digital sovereignty on the world stage. We need to make sure that Europe stays relevant and at the table. Um, I think the combination of the external shocks of Brexit, the Trump administration, the growing assertiveness of China, and the COVID pandemic have really galvanized the EU into playing a much larger role in the world, politically and economically. And that's um, very visible if you take a look at the Commission's ambitious WEC program, because I haven't seen anything quite like it since the 1992 internal market project. For the first time, we're, we're seeing talk of a broad industrial policy uh, to allow European industry to emerge stronger, greener, more digital, and more competitive globally. Uh, Fiona makes a lot of good points, actually. And uh, you know what? I agree. There's there's not a lot to disagree on here. Um, but there's there are certain things that I, I, I kind of really wish to see bigger on. First of all, I was surprised to find that the EU um, even has an EU innovation scoreboard. And um, uh, unless uh, the new commission, which is not so new any longer, it's been a year already, uh, and it's markedly different from the Juncker Commission. Um, unless the new EU Commission has, you know, economists and technocrats and computer scientists and engineers and each of the vice president's team, uh, Europe is not going to be able to meet some of the challenges we've we've seen emerge in, in, in the past six to eight months. So just having policy advisors and communication personnel is not no longer going to be enough if, if the EU doesn't want to get left behind in the race to innovate. Um, in, in terms of uh, the the vigor that you mentioned, yes, it's quite an ambitious plan that uh, Commissioner von der Leyen has proposed, but it remains to be seen whether she actually has support from the council. Uh, they've gone on record saying that, yes, they will listen, but they might not support everything. Uh, and um, some of the terms that we've heard um, emerge over the past year um, have been, or longer than a year, have been, you know, tech sovereignty or digital sovereignty or um, some, some other kind of sovereignty. These are all buzzwords and to some extent also memes that have popped up. Um, it might have sounded a bit nationalistic, unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe that's the need of the hour, um, given the challenges we are facing. Uh, but then again, you know, the exact definition remains unclear. Um, uh, there are avenues where Europe must pull itself up by its, its bootstraps. Um, well, you know, just for example, I think uh, if, we, if we talk about COVID these days, two big pharma companies have criticized the lack of a European equivalent to the US Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority that, you know, singly deals with negotiations for um, advanced purchase agreements of COVID-19 vaccines. And it's only now that the EU is, you know, thinking about this to, to sort of set up an agency to help late stage medical research. So, uh, I think that there's the intention is right. It definitely does need vigor. And um, I hope that the EU does actually move in that direction ably and fast. Yeah, thanks, Kashita. You're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, rhetoric is one thing, whether it actually lands and makes a difference in time for European uh, citizens, you know, looking for job security and economic security as we hopefully pull out of the COVID crisis is, is quite another thing. Um, so I, I, I just would add to that, that the commission is 
you know, contrary to some attempts from some European governments to pull down all the rules in order to build up European champions, the, the basic philosophy still seems to be <clears throat> if European companies want to succeed in the world stage, then the best training ground for them is in a competitive and healthy single market. Um, and this notion of level playing field is um, increasingly in the spotlight, both in terms of um, the internal market rules and the state aid rules uh, in the Brexit context, but also in the context of the white paper and foreign subsidies, um, which also I think shows the geopolitical sort of awakening of the commission to say, if, if we are imposing such high standards on European companies in our single market, um, we've got to do something for them to protect them in that market against unfair competition as a result of foreign subsidies. So that's another relatively new and interesting angle. Um, to, to, to help manage a fast and strong recovery, Commissioner Versteiger has prioritized defending the single market through the robust enforcement of the existing competition rules. And she's looking to arm herself with some new toys, the new competition tool, the foreign subsidies tool. Um, there's a thorough, robust uh, review of many of the competition rules going on, which I think will impact the debate. But two other priorities that we're going to be talking about in the time remaining. One is the Commission's desire to be proactive on climate change. And there's an interesting consultation on at the moment on how the competition rules need to shift in order to implement the Green Deal. And the other priority in, is in relation to being proactive on, on all things digital. Uh, as, as many of you know, the Commission has a wide ranging agenda from reigning in the big platforms, sponsoring a European digital health space, keeping competition on digital markets fair, uh, funding and sponsoring an EU cloud infrastructure and services industry. So, so an ambitious agenda coupled with, uh, let's not forget the recovery plan, with the next generation EU project that is, um, if it passes muster, <laughs> designed to pump no less than 750 billion euros into the economy, 30% of which has been earmarked for climate change and 20% for digital investment. That's a lot of money mm -hmm. to be an innovator in Europe, uh, to capitalize on that funding as it starts coming through. Quite right, Fiona. and. Um... I know that this panel, uh, this dialogue would be a lot more interesting if we disagreed on, on, on things, but um, so far I find myself agreeing with you on, on several things. Um, uh, I think just, just I should perhaps mention that um, ever since uh, Commissioner Vestager has this, was given this dual role as competition commissioner and, and executive vice president, uh, there's always been questions about her ability to, you know, balance the, you know, walk the thin rope, as it were, of, of her two jobs. I totally agree with you over here uh, that, yes, uh, there has to be a level playing field. European companies must be uh, able to compete with, you know, the, the big danger out there that we see the big Chinese state-owned enterprises, as they call it, SOEs. Uh, and we shouldn't actually be feeding these companies, like making it easier for them uh, in Europe uh, to, to compete in, so that you know, it, it shouldn't be harming them on the world stage. Uh, all of that is right, but I think at the same time, there has to be an effort where if you're taking something, if you're making life difficult for European companies, then uh, there's, there's also got to be a little support we ought to give them somewhere. Um, I just want to flag a few things. These are not directly related to merger control, but just some of the threats that I see coming from other large economies in the world. So for instance, Europe has made a good start with its cloud computing initiative, um, Gaia X, uh, but it has to work some more on it. Uh, we have these you know, big, large technology companies in other parts of the world uh, that sort of have uh, I'm trying not to use the word monopoly, but well, they are there and they're dominant. Uh, so there's, there's, that's, that's one thing Europe needs to work on. And then there are other aspects of the European economy, uh, you know, the commission and the commissioners must be attention to. Uh, let's take lithium ion batteries, for instance. I mean, 80% of the, these batteries are 
made in Asia, and most of it is in China. Uh, there's already a debate about the European car industry. There's a separate debate about, um, you know, connected cars and licensing. But when it comes to lithium ion batteries, this is, you know, it's another subject and production of these is mainly concentrated in Asia. So what happens to Euro Europe's car industry 10 years or 15 years down the line? Uh, carbon pricing, that's, you know, that's a green deal subject as well as a trade subject uh, uh, and, and also something for European uh, competitiveness. So uh, it, it's pretty sensitive. It's, it's a divisive uh, topic. And um, uh, I think there has to be a level playing field. Uh, and maybe the commission could start by imposing some kind of carbon, you know, levy on, on imports. Otherwise, local European goods are going to be more expensive than, than imported ones. Climate change, as you mentioned, yes, how are we going to fit competition policy to to make sure that we meet our you know green deal objectives i think big tech could perhaps play a role here uh, and not just big tech but also coupling it with the construction sector and and you know other infrastructure arms of the economy um, how about you know the commission balance energy demand supply by integrating it with you know smart homes or or intelligent public transportation systems um, so, well, this needs constant refinement. There's, there's no cure or no vaccine for, um, for climate change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, back to you, Fiona. Thanks, Kushita. I, I, what you say, you know, is, is very relevant because you've just cited a couple of examples which just show how very interconnected and complex today's modern economy is um, in so many facets, whether it's digital energy, where those two collide and merge, um, and there are a lot, there are a lot of synergies. And against that complexity, that's a really nice lead-in to the next point that I wanted to make, which is to ask the question about whether the current competition rules are really fit for purpose and sufficiently agile and nimble enough to be encouraging the right sorts of collaboration to bring some of these complex projects to fruition and to make sure that sectors of the European economy are, are placed on a good st standing for, for, for a very uncertain future as the, the pace of technological change just accelerates at speeds that you know, just a couple of years ago we couldn't have imagined. So I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about the current rules and horizontal collaboration, which um, for many, many years, I have thought have just been far too rigid, incrementally being nudged every 10 years. And I think we've come to a point in time where they're really not fit for purpose, I would argue. Um, in the height of the COVID crisis, the commission has issued two COVID related comfort letters, one in relation to the generic pharmaceutical industry, the other in relation to automotive companies get together to make sure their suppliers don't go bust in the next couple of months. But that slow sort of incremental reactionary approach doesn't signal what I think we need, which is a radical shift in, in approach. So the first point I'd like to stress is that I think in particular, the rules on R&D and to some extent technology transfer are overly rigid and, and not fit for purpose. We need much more flexibility to incentivize the sorts of broad collaboration that is required in today's dynamic economy. Um, an old set of rules with do's and don'ts tied to a 25% market share threshold is really uh, not very helpful. It excludes um, a, a lot of um, pharma collaboration deals, for example, from the block exemption safe harbor because of the threshold and narrow market definitions. Um, I don't think that parties should be treated as competitors in innovation spaces, unless it's clear that their innovation efforts are in direct competition with one another. So the notion of potential competition, I think should remain grounded on likely and foreseeable market entry. Um, the block exemptions are really focused at collaboration between competitors, which is why that notion of potential comp competition is, is very relevant. Um, also, uh, it, it takes the same approach, the block exemption on R&D takes the same approach, depending on whether the parties are uh, close competitors in a given therapeutic area, for example. Um, as to when one pharmaceutical company is actually paying for research and development to be done by somebody else at its instructions. 
Um, I think there's a very solid argument to say that that is a vertical relationship, not a horizontal relationship, where there's outsourcing of development activities. And um, I think the, the R&D rules really should be considerably simplified to deal with some of those new sorts of arrangements. Um, the rules in the R&D block exemption around the joint exploitation of re joint research results also need an overhaul. Um, I think one of the biggest weaknesses of the block exemption is that under the current rules, if parties to joint R&D um, collaborate, they cannot agree on output or price unless they are selling through a joint sales organization. So um, where parties have made significant investments in co-developing a new product, I think as a general rule, they should be able to share profits and determine pricing, uh, whether or not there is a joint sales organization. Uh, and I think another issue is um, just the whole area of big data. The commission has said separately that it wants Europe to be a data hub. That means bringing large amounts of European data together. Um, and whether it's in the healthcare area or many other areas of the economy, I think the, the, the horizontal rules need to tackle that issue and encourage the pooling of, of big data um, and, and show considerably more flexibility given the fast pace of change in, in the economy. So these are just some, some comments on, on the R&D block exemption. Uh, that was uh, that you covered quite a lot of things in 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 that um, couple of minutes, Fiona. But uh, what stood out to me was your mention of potential competition, and I know that's sort of uh, not a very well liked word in in uh, the merger circle these days. Uh, interestingly, on this side of the pond, yesterday the um, Federal Trade Commission's uh, chairman Joe Simon said a few things about uh, merger review and and nascent competition but before i before i uh, sort of go into what he said uh, and i have to be careful here not to impose my views uh, and be a, be a neutral party because i'm a reporter after all i want to i want to hear your views on on merger reviews and potential competition and killer acquisitions sorry those those are like quite a lot of topics all in one question <laughs> Okay, so let's let's talk about innovation and merger control, which is a fascinating topic. <laughs> so, um, You're quite the champion there. <laughs> well, there is a very fine balance to be struck, I think, between protecting innovation, which is um, by all means a, a very valid goal, and not taking it so far. Um, to actually dampen uh, innovation or protect potential innovation at all costs, I would say. So um, I think it's well established uh, that merger review rightly protects innovation. And there's a long line of case law protecting innovation at the product pipeline stage where there's been overlaps in medical devices and Metronic Covidium case uh, in Pfizer, Hospira, and Novartis G GSK. There's also been an uptick in the frequency of remedies designed to protect innovation. Um, I've said in the past that I thought the Dow Dupont case was a, a was a case of regulatory overreach. I know that not everybody agrees with me on that one, but, but my problem with that was that the Commission went considerably further than in prior cases looking beyond products in the pipeline to overlapping areas of basic research um, in innovation spaces, which the commission admitted were not markets, uh, basic research at a level that's upstream, far, far away from any actual product market. Um, and, and the debate continues uh, in the recent uh, merger between two DNA sequencing, sequencing firms, uh, Illumina PacBio, the UK CMA argued that given overlap in assets, including research personnel, that merger was likely to have anti-competitive effects on innovation incentives, and the deal was abandoned. Um, I think it's unfortunate that any pro-competitive innovation effects, such as you know, the pulling together of complementary R&D expertise or technologies, is relegated to an efficiencies analysis. Um, 
think those arguments shouldn't just be an afterthought, but should be a legitimate part of setting out the story about why the parties are doing the deal in the first place. So efficiencies in R&D, I think today are viewed with automatic suspicion. Um, and I would take the view that prioritization of R&D efforts after a merger should not in itself be a competition concern. I think the main focus should be on closeness of competition and not on simple metrics like the number of researchers the parties have or the overall dollar investment number in research and development that they're planning. Okay, so I, um, I'm going to play the devil's advocate, but uh, let me just clarify, these are not my views. I speak as a reporter who goes to plenty of conferences and covers these officials. Uh, just, to, just, just to sort of give an opposing view, I, yes, uh, there, there's, there are a lot of people who don't agree with the fact that the commission did overreach on the innovation theory of harm. Uh, what I do look at in amazement is when uh, some national heads of competition authorities uh, use very colorful language to, to describe these kind of mergers, like, for instance, Martin Snoop uh, described color acquisitions as, as a disease that needs to be controlled. Uh, or, um, well, some, some have been a little more sensible in, in saying things like, yes, killer, killer acquisitions or, or just gauging potential harm or gauging whether a pipeline is actually going to be developed in the future is, is very difficult. Uh, uh, we had uh, the Bundeskart alums Andreas Mund say that. Uh, on, on this side of the pond, the same tone has been reflected, at least when it comes to pack bioalumina uh, to some extent. Um, and just yesterday we had uh, Joe Simons uh, basically say that merger review should take seriously uh, you know should seriously take the magnitude and not just the probability of um, possible harm uh, and i'm just quoting from what he said um, he said a myopic focus on the probability of entry creates some very strange and undesirable possibilities i think that's pretty strong language um, i would also perhaps agree with you a little bit uh, and other lawyers uh, on, on, in Brussels who've said it's not right to compare an airline merger with a um, merger in the chemicals industry or, or a turbines merger. So for instance, uh, a GE Alstom, that was also criticized a lot. Uh, so I would perhaps try and take the diplomatic standpoint over here, not side either way. Uh, but just to push this debate a bit further, uh, Interestingly, uh, we had another FTC commissioner yesterday say, uh, call for a pause in merger reviews and what I call stretching the clock. So is that, um, is that, is that a suggestion that could uh, perhaps not even be made in a place like Brussels? Like how could you stop the clock indefinitely uh, just because we have COVID and we have staff constraints? And I I'm, know I'm shifting the ball a little bit, uh, but what do, you, what do you think about stretching, stretching the clock when it comes to killer acquisitions? Because it's hard to understand whether uh, some of these acquisitions are actually killer or they're going to buy these companies and develop them um, as we've seen with Facebook, WhatsApp. Yeah, so... Uh... This is all news to me, Krishit, and it's absolutely fascinating what you're saying. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna address this in any particular order, but let me just um, give you some thoughts in reaction to what I've heard you say. Um, I, I like what you said, quoting Joe, in terms of um, what's important is magnitude and not just the possibility of harm. So yes, we need to protect innovation where there's a likelihood of innovation harm, but that requires a very detailed factual analysis of a specific market. And, and the reality is, and I, I agree with that, because the reality is that R&D choices are made all the time, even within a big pharmaceutical company or any large company with a big R&D budget. The amount of money to be invested is finite, and they parcel that money up into whatever projects um, they think are most uh, likely to generate return on investment. 
So those sorts of choices are made all the time. And the fact that they're made in a, in a merger control context or um, on the acquisition of of a small startup or you know whatever it is it's a fact of life and um the fact that those decisions are taken isn't in and of itself uh, a problem there is um ever since the sort of scuffle to try and capture facebook's acquisition of whatsapp whatsapp back in the time when it was a small startup not generating any revenue there's been a very lively economic and policy debate on on the size of the problem. And there have been some studies that suggest that potentially 6% of pharmaceutical acquisitions of small startups dampen innovation, or don't allow the startup product to come to market. Is that 6% in and of itself a problem? I don't think so. It depends on, you know, the, the level of research and innovation in, in, in a specific therapeutic sector. So I do think we, we need to bring it back into the real world and, and not just conceptually object uh, to the notion of killer acquisitions as such, because um, I think it might be a problem in, in a minority of cases rather than a systemic uh, long-term problem in, in any particular sector. Um, there's also, I think, the point that, you know, certainly in the tech sector, some of those startups come into existence with the express purpose of being bought out. And if you kill off that sort of M&A angle, you don't have the incentives for the guys sitting at the kitchen table to make the initial investment up front. Uh, there's also some literature there around um, lack of deep unified European capital markets. Um, so Europe is as competitive as the United States in terms of basic research, but it's getting to the mid cap sized where you need deeper capital markets. And, uh, and, and stopping M&A activity in that space might, might have knock on effects, which, which are detrimental. Um, I think to your point on, on the process and stopping the clock and what, what, what should happen, um, well, first of all, I'm glad that European agencies seem to be more resilient in terms of being able to work from home and more or less stick to deadlines. We've seen some delays and some short term measures at the beginning of the first lockdown, but I think things are more or less on track from a merger control perspective. But there is an interesting question about do the merger control rules need to be changed, modeled on the German and Austrian thresholds for deal value rather than revenue thresholds to capture big companies buying small startups with little or no revenue. And I thought it was interesting, I think I read a speech from Commissioner Versteiger in the last couple of weeks where she seems to have ruled out changing the merger control thresholds to build in a value of the transaction threshold. But she has said that the solution to this problem is hiding in plain sight was interested in that phrase, uh, reading on, she says, well, why don't we simply accept referrals from member states where they spot a acquisition of a small startup, uh, whether or not that, that could be potentially problematic, whether or not the member state competition authority has the power to review the case themselves under their domestic merger control regulation. So if they go down that route, I think it's a bit of a sleight of hand um, that does risk creating considerable legal uncertainty. Because, um, you know, what's the time frame? How do you check? Uh, I mean, I, I just have lots of questions about how that's going to operate in, in practice. I get the sense, uh, uh, Fiona, you and uh, your colleagues would definitely not be in favor of a uh, of a merger or reviewing a merger. What do you call it? Ex post review once the merger is through, and then you know unbreak or unmerge the merged entity. Um, <clears throat> I think most companies um, prefer to have closure. <clears throat> they do the deal, they get it approved, they can move on. I, at the same time, you know, some regimes do a live for an ex post review, the UK being one of them. But but there, you know, um, I think as long as companies are on notice, uh, 
as to likely sort of theories of harm and there are sort of timetables nonetheless there are, at some point you know you, you do know where you stand so I suppose the long and the short of it is if if the commission were to go down that route companies would be um, well advised to make sure that uh, the reasons for them doing those sorts of deals are well documented from the outset and and that they you know that they have contemporaneous record of the logic behind the deal right from the get-go. It's probably a prag pragmatic solution to that. I think companies would prefer to deal with the pain of having to go through a, of a long and arduous review than having uh, their internal documents sort of thrown about in a public hearing with uh, four CEOs in front of a House Judiciary Committee here in the US. and. Uh, uh, the, the you know the hot dogs basically sh sh be shown up and and internal emails uh, you know bandied about uh, where where they perhaps talk about oh how uh, one CEO wanted to go into destroy mode um, again just reporting on the facts not yeah. my personal views yeah. uh, but just to sort of wrap this up I was um, I was wondering what your views were uh, in terms of creating some sort of coalition of like-minded enforcers or countries or authorities. Where do you see uh, competition enforcement going forward? Yeah. Well, um, I've, I've been around long enough to have sort of witnessed the birth of the ICN and the enthusiasm of global competition authorities uh, really pulling together in, in the early days. Um, over the last decade, I think we've seen um, more fragmentation of views, um, different enforcement priorities. I am a firm believer in strong multilateralism and um, coherence of rules globally so that industry has certainty and uh, predictability. I think we stand a better chance of getting back to more of that um, under a Biden administration. And if there's one area where I think there needs to be a global debate um, amongst antitrust agencies is, is how to um, reshape the competition rules in support of the monumental efforts that governments and companies will need to be making uh, if we are to um, you know, reach the climate change goals that we've set ourselves under the Paris Agreement. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was to go ahead. No, uh, so uh, unfortunately, again, for our viewers, I have to say I agree with you here that uh, perhaps uh, the new administration will um, provide better opportunities for collaboration. There has been a view in uh, lobbying circles, at least here in Washington, that the, the Trump administration was perhaps a little transactional when it came to taking on cases. Uh, so they went after marijuana mergers or, you know, there, there is cons consensus on pursuing big tech monopolization cases, uh, but they wanna do it for different reasons. So yes, to, to an extent, a Biden administration would be, there, there would probably be more, uh, or what I, should I say, perhaps less disagreement on, on things, uh, but let's not forget that we, it is, there is a divide uh, and the EU was not part of the five eyes agreement that that US and Australia and UK sort of have come together for from time to time. And uh, there will be internal disagreements and uh, not, to, not to put uh, to find a point on the fact that Kamala Harris used to be, you know, she was in charge of uh, California before and she's known to be uh, more sympathetic to large technology companies and uh, again, uh, how is how is Vestager going to you know balance the the job that she has as as competition commissioner and, and vice president? So I don't see any reason why there can't be a coalition of authorities of like-minded countries, and 
just in a speech yesterday, Vestager did call for the EU and the US to work together on a, you know, on a convergence and a rule book and, and she announced a renewed transatlantic relationship. So yes, there is definitely vigor on the European side, but I think once things settle down in the US, which will take another three to six months because we don't know what the landing team is going to look like in, uh, in the Biden administration, uh, it's, it's a little too early to say where the chips might fall. Um, so uh, yes, that's, that's, where, that's where I stand. Well, look, uh, fascinating um, insights, Kashita, into what might be coming next. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I also agree that um, Harvest Tiger, Commissioner of Tiger, balances her role as competition commissioner and, and uh, digital guru is another interesting question. Uh, I think it's also quite interesting that there's a prospect of European competition fines going into specific investment, EU investment funds, rather than back to the member states. That changes incentives potentially. So there's, everything is changing around us. Um, there's a level of sort of dynamism in the economy, at the policy level, in response to all of these various shocks that we're experiencing. I think it's an absolutely fascinating time and I don't think any of us have a clear view as to how it's gonna go for the next couple of years, but um, I'm glad to be around.